Hello and welcome to Lecture 7. This time around we're going to be talking about color. Specifically, we're going to get into color models and modes, color spaces, and color profiles. This is the deep, dense part of color that you may not discuss in a more artistic type of class. Possibly, you never know. But these are things that are going to affect how color behaves in your files. Uh, and that goes for when they're displayed on the web, when they're printed or reproduced in other methods. Uh, as you edit them, what colors are you going to have available to you? How large is your gamut? All that kind of stuff. So prepare to dive a little deeper into color here. Uh, we're not talking about just choosing the appropriate color palette. We're talking more about the specifics of how color behaves digitally. So first off, terminology. We're going to cover some things here that uh, can be confusing. Some of the terminology is used interchangeably. And that's um, not always accurate, but sometimes it is, and that just makes it all the more confusing. But first off, let's be sure on, on what a mode and a model are. They are the exact same thing. A color model is a, simply a way of describing colors as numbers based on a mathematical formula. A mode is just the setting in Photoshop that determines what model is being used. So a mode and a model are the same thing. If you ever see that question pop up, or if you're ever curious about that, just be aware that those are the same thing. So those mathematical models are based on a number of things. Um, just a few of those is how the eye perceives color, how light works, uh, the way that inks interact on paper to create color. And, and there's a few other ways that, that we come up with color modes. We're gonna only focus on two of those modes though. First off is RGB. So RGB is an additive color system or emissive. It's based on systems that emit light. So as you add different colors of light together, different wavelengths of light, they all combine to make white. As you add equal parts red, green, and blue, you get white. And that's based on light being output from something that is able to do that. In the situation with a digital camera or scanner, that's recording light, so it's still additive color, even though it's not necessarily emitting color like you might think. CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and that K stands for black. That's the system that's used for print. It has to do with how light is reflected off of a substrate like paper. And as it's reflected off, part of that gets absorbed by whatever pigments or inks are on that paper. As light's absorbed, some of it is subtracted out of the visible spectrum. And what's left reflects off. And what's left that reflects off is what we see. So when you look at a sheet of paper that has ASU maroon on it, for example, that means that that maroon pigment is absorbing all the other frequencies or wavelengths of light, except for what we perceive as that maroon. So that's subtractive. Now, it's used for, this CMYK mode is used strictly for printing. We don't really use it for much of any other things. Um, and it also has some limitations, which we're going to talk about next. One of those limitations of CMYK is its gamut. It doesn't have as large of a gamut as some of the RGB spaces, or as, the, as large as the RGB color mode. Part of the reason for that is that paper in itself and the inks are imperfect in that they don't reflect 100% of the light that is hitting them. So if you have, let's say, some yellow ink on a sheet of paper, it's not going to reflect 100% of the yellow light from the visible spectrum that's shining on that paper. Some of it is still going to be absorbed. You're never going to get quite as bright of reproduction as you would with emissive light or additive light systems. So um, the color model is represented here on this little diagram. Um, the visible spectrum is that big triangular thumb shaped blob. You can see that that is just, I mean, this is just a graphical representation to give you guys an idea but it's pretty large. The size of that indicates how many different colors and the vibrancy and saturation of those different hues that we are capable of perceiving, approximately. The smaller triangle just inside that Adobe RGB is a color space, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide what exactly a space is. But that implementation of the RGB color model is smaller. We go down from that, we have sRGB, and within that CMYK, which is actually probably quite a bit smaller than what you might see here in this uh, graph. I've seen it represented lots of different ways, but um, it's, it's smaller. We just can't reproduce the same vibrant blues and greens and yellows and reds and all those things with ink on paper that we can with bright lights coming out of those pixels on your monitor screen. So 
A color space is, like I said, a specific implementation of a color model. Uh, there's device dependent and device independent color spaces. These are simply ways of interpreting the color model to apply that across a broad variety of either devices or systems. So a device dependent is like it says here on the screen, made to compensate for the color signature behavior of a, or a of a device like a, a printer or monitor. That's terribly written. Now I'm going to have to correct that. <laughs> but anyways, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Made to compensate for the color signature behavior of a device like a printer or a monitor. So for example, we're going to look at some working, some color spaces on the next slide too, that, uh, that are typically used for certain things. Like if I'm going to output something to a web page or post it on social media, there's a color space that's going to be not specific to my individual monitor, but it's going to be a space that is friendly to lots of different kinds of monitors or emissive devices. So, Breaking this down even further, those color spaces we can categorize as working spaces and delivery spaces, which we'll talk about next. But working spaces, here are some examples of working spaces. Adobe RGB and Profoto RGB are two um, fairly wide gamut RGB color spaces that are in the RGB color mode or model. They are specific implementations of RGB that allow uh, more information to be communicated within a system so that color can be reproduced uh, consistently across different different platforms or applications or operating systems. CMYK uh, spaces, you have SWAP, which is typically referred to as US web coded. Uh, standard web offset printing is what that SWAP stands for. And Grackle is how that's pronounced. Those are two um, fairly common CMYK working spaces. Now, working space is still just a color space, but it's a setting in your color settings in Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign or, or Bridge or whatever you're looking with with Adobe that um, defines how color is going to come into and be handled in that particular open document that you might have. What's the gamut of the document that you're working on at the moment? So you want to set your working space to give you the most overhead. Um, depending on the output that you're going for. So if you're designing for print, for example, you might choose Grackle for your working space because your output is going to go to a printer that is consistently close to the Grackle color space and reproducing certain colors. Likewise, if you're going to go to the web and you're editing photographs, you might start with Pro Photo. Photos in the name, that might be a giveaway, but if you're working with photos from a high-end digital camera that shoots raw, Go with Profoto, that's going to give you the most possible um, color to work with. It's a very large gamut in Profoto RGB. It's bigger than all the others. Delivery spaces. These are the spaces that are going to be converted to when you deliver your file to a client or for output. So sRGB, I mentioned before, the S, um, it's debatable what that stands for, standardized or small RGB uh, but typically, that's going to be fairly consistent color across a wide variety of digital devices. Monitors, tablets, cell phones, TVs, that kind of thing. So that'll get you close to where you're not going to have a drastic or dramatic change when you convert from a wide gamut profile like Profoto down to sRGB. If I were to post a, a photo on Instagram that was in Profoto color space, um, there's no telling exactly how the app or individual devices would render those colors because there may be colors that are out of gamut for those devices. For example, I might have a green in the photo in the digital file when it's in the pro photo space that is way too bright, way too saturated to actually reproduce on a phone screen. And so what's the screen? What's the device going to do? How is it going to render that color? Is it going to turn it yellow or, or is it going to turn it purple? You never know. So anyway, that's the purpose of these delivery spaces is to provide a uniform system of communicating color information about a file. And that goes along with the file that's always embedded within the document. CMYK profiles, there are quite a few of those. So your delivery space when you're working with CMYK will vary and communication is the most important thing. You want to discuss this in advance if you can with the printer. That's a capital P. I'm talking about not a person, but an institution that handles commercial printing. Um, they're going to typically have 
a profile that they have uh, arranged and tested and used on all their printing presses that works the best for their, their setup and their inks and their substrates and all that sort of thing. If they don't, or they may choose to just give you a generic one or ask you to use a generic one like Swap or Grackle, that's fine too, but you just want to communicate with them and find out what is going to give you the best results. Having some sort of embedded profile in your document, even if they don't know or, or require anything, is going to give a starting point to their devices. So even if the people on the other end working with you don't know what's going on, most of the time their devices will. So having a profile embedded in your document, at least you'll know what your starting point is. And when it comes back from the printer and the colors are terrible, you have something to say that in this profile, I proofed it, it looked this way and it was good. Okay. So I kept saying profile on that last screen, and this is where we're going to talk about what a profile is. Basically, this is a color, the numerical model of a color space. So if you were talking about little nesting dolls, those things where a tiny doll fits inside of a slightly bigger one and a bigger one, it goes model, and then inside of that is a color space, and inside of that is a color profile. So profile is a very specific um, model of a device. So if I were to take my computer monitor, I can actually run a program on it. It's going to flash a series of colors and brightness values. And I have a device that I can put on the screen. It has a little sensor and it watches all those colors. And so when my graphics card says show 100% red on the screen and it comes out a little bit pink on my monitor, that device is able to build a calibration and a profile that corrects for that. That profile is just a description of the specific behavior of that device. So a monitor can have a profile, a printer can have a profile, a camera, a scanner, anything that handles color can have a color profile. That simply describes the meaning of those color values so that your application or system or whatever can properly interpret color behavior based on that device's specific individual characteristics. So, Terminology wise, this is where it gets tricky a little bit because the color space is in a lot of ways also a color profile and a profile isn't quite exactly a color space, but you'll hear the terms used quite often interchangeably. And I slip up all the time and do that myself too. Um, the key thing here is that third, that last bullet point is all images must have an embedded color profile. I want you to be aware of that and make note of that. Um, we're going to look at how to do that and your textbook will show you too. If not, Adobe's, photo, Adobe's help file documentation uh, online will also walk you through that um, if you need more assistance looking into that. Okay, so some things to consider. When you're converting from an RGB model, uh, I'm sorry, an RGB space to a different profile or from one RGB profile to another, um, there are some differences in color. They're not quite as drastic as when you're going from RGB down to CMYK. Because if you think back to the slide that I showed you earlier on that showed the size of the gamut, remember RGB model has lots of capability of rendering tons of really bright, saturated, vibrant colors. CMYK just doesn't. Imagine uh, those of you who are old enough to have seen a newspaper. <laughs> if you haven't, I'm sure you can find one or you've seen something. But the color of a newspaper print isn't that great look at the paper itself, it's kind of a grayish, um, not very bright white paper. And it's very absorbent. If you drip some water on it, it's going to soak in and spread out quite a bit. The characteristics of that paper, the ink that's used on it, the way that it soaks in and spreads out when it's printed, those all lead to a very small gamut, meaning the paper is not very reflective to begin with. And so it's not going to reflect a whole lot of that light. And reflected light is the whole basis for CMYK color. So you have very um, flat, low contrast images that don't have a ton of saturation in the colors with CMYK. So converting from a large gamut like Profoto RGB down to newsprint, for example, means that that really bright, vibrant, saturated green grass that you took a photo of is going to turn out in a, in a print in newspaper looking like just a blob of light green. Um, there's not going to be a whole lot of detail or differences between the subtle shades of green in every blade of grass like you'd see on your monitor. So there's a few things to keep in mind. 
One is that transformation between color models is destructive. You're going to be throwing away color when you do that. You're mapping a large gamut to a smaller gamut, and that's why those colors disappear. Um, when they disappear, they don't. They have to be converted from a bright color down to something less saturated and less bright. And I'm going to show you a little graphic on the next slide that kind of illustrates that a little bit. Um, the idea is to preserve as much of the color appearance and accuracy as possible. So after the conversion, you're just not going to have the exact same colors that you did before. But perceptually, you might be able to make it look like the colors are relatively the same as they were before. So if you if you look at the image itself, it'll look good still. If you look at it side by side with the original, it might not look good no matter what you do. But the goal is to get it as, as, as good looking as you possibly can. So there's a few things to do uh, to get to that point. One is when you convert to profile, make sure you turn on preview. The textbook is going to have some more instructions on proofing and there's a question on the quiz I'll just give you a heads up that I'm not answering in this uh, lecture right now and it might be misleading if you look at that but you want to be sure to look into soft proofing <laughs> just a little tip there hopefully that hint helps a couple of you out anyways when you convert to profile turn on preview that's going to show you on screen the results of that color conversion and you'll see sometimes that it's quite a significant difference it really just depends on what colors you have in your original image um, the source that you see in that convert to profile dialog, that means what is your current profile or space of your document as it exists right now. The destination is what you're going to choose that you convert to. So the source might be Adobe RGB, for example. My destination might be swap. And that is my conversion. I'm converting from Adobe RGB to swap. There's going to be a check mark at the bottom of that panel to flatten the layers to preserve appearance. That's an important thing to make note of. Um, hopefully, I've drilled into you guys in our previous lectures and from the reading that flattening your layers is, de is destructive and you should really try to avoid it. And yes, that's true. The problem is that when you do that with color, it's going to change the behavior of your adjustments. A lot of the things that you do in Photoshop as far as adjustment layers are based on RGB channels and the interaction of those channels. If you don't flatten your layers, then all those interactions are no longer based on RGB and they don't function properly. So you might not get the same results that you had with your layers, your adjustment layers uh, in RGB as you would in CMYK. So just be careful. Um, again, you can preview it and see what the results are. You can do it and hit undo and go back. Just be careful. That always just makes me a little bit nervous. Um, my personal recommendation is to work in the widest gamut possible. So Adobe RGB is typically good enough for most things. Unless you're doing high-end photography stuff, then go with Profoto. Uh, that gives you all the overhead you could possibly need for working with color uh, up to the point where you're ready to output for delivery. At that point, you're going to save your PSD and then create a copy of it, flatten the copy, and then do your color conversion. So you have your original in the wide gamut RGB mode, and then you have a duplicate that you can convert to whatever CMYK profile is appropriate. Okay, so this right here, when you when you do a color conversion, you'll notice there's also a drop down box um, for rendering intents. And these are two of the rendering intents that you'll see. This is just a quick graphic. Um, you can find this online. I just pulled it up real quick to illustrate the idea of what happens to your colors when you make a conversion. There's a couple different intents, and those intents determine exactly how those colors are transformed when you do that conversion. So the top one, relative colorimetric, is going to keep a one-to-one -one conversion between all the colors that are already in gamut. Everything that's outside of gamut is going to be moved into the nearest possible point. And so what you'll get is, and this is a gross exaggeration of what actually happens. It's more subtle than this. But if you look at the top graphic, you have purple on the top and red on the bottom. And when it's converted to the smaller gamut, those colors disappear. And the resulting image means you're going to have big chunks of yellow and blue where you only had red and magenta before. Now, again, that's exaggerating things, but that's the basic idea. With perceptual, you see that all the points of color are 
are converted in uh, relation to each other. And so the resulting image perceptually looks the same as it did before unless you hold it up next to the original. So again, depending on what it is that you're converting, you may choose one or the other. Uh, sometimes that most accurate possible relative or absolute colorimetric uh, rendering intent is going to give you the best results when you're converting something that has, for example, a brand color or a logo or specific spot colors in it. Um, whereas if you're doing just a photograph of a scene in nature or a person or something like that, perceptual is probably going to work out better for you. Lastly, it's always important to remember, like I said, you always, always, always need to make sure that your file has a color profile embedded. And there are a few places that it's easy to miss that. On the left-hand side, that's a little screen cap of the Save As dialog box. There's a check mark next to your color profile, and you need to make sure that that's checked on. That's going to embed that profile in the document itself. On the right-hand side, that's part of the Save for Web dialog. And there are two check marks in that one, one to embed the color profile, which you want to always have checked on. It's going to just embed it with whatever the color profile is of your working space. If you're saving for web, then you probably also want to go ahead and convert it to sRGB at the same time. So that's in there as well. Um, however, you end up getting your files out of Photoshop. Once you've done so, I recommend double checking it. Just open it back up in Photoshop. Uh, take a look at the metadata panel and bridge. Um, if you know how, you can go into the properties of the file in uh, Windows Explorer or in Finder, but that's a lot of effort. Just look at it in, in Bridge in the metadata panel. Anyways, um, good luck, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.